Hello, everybody. Welcome to worship for this third Sunday after Pentecost. Let's begin this week with a brief order for confession and forgiveness. Let us pray. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Drawn into Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe that there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are nourished and fed. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant and eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. O God, you are the tree of life, offering shelter to all in the world. Craft us into yourself and nurture our growth, that we may hear your truth and love to those in need, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first lesson is written in the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of a cedar. I will set it out. I will break off a tender one from the topmost of its young twigs. I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it in order that it may produce boughs and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. Under it, every kind of bird will live. In the shade of its branches will nest winged creatures of every kind. All the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree. I make high the low tree. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will accomplish it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is written in 2 Corinthians. St. Paul writes, So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others, but we ourselves are well known to God. And I hope that we are also well known to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearance and not in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all. Therefore, for all have died, and he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. The word of the Lord Thanks be to God. The gospel is written in the gospel according to St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, 
The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, and puts forth large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables he spoke the word to them, as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. This week, our attention is drawn to the subject of miracles. There seem to be a lot of those in the Bible, and over the years and the centuries, many people have retold the stories of these miracles in a way to try to prove the truth of what the Bible says. But miracles don't really prove anything. Instead, they reveal. They reveal great truths, often truths that we may not be comfortable with, truths that we may want to hide from or deny. And anyway, in the 21st century, we're kind of inundated with miracles. I mean, when I was in high school, I never would have imagined carrying a computer in my pocket that was more powerful than that carried in the Apollo capsule that went to the moon. I never would have imagined that we would be moving cars with electricity or many of the other things we do in today's world. And because of this, maybe I'm a little bit awestruck, but I'm also aware that uh, kids who are now in college and graduating from college are used to carrying phones in their pocket. They're used to the idea that they'll be driving electric cars someday. So we aren't always as awestruck by the miracles in our midst as we might think we should be. Today, Jesus himself refers to a couple of everyday miracles as everyday and common as your cell phone is to you. Not to prove anything, but to, to describe something by way of analogy. In fact, I've heard it said that miracles become invisible when they become commonplace. So, thus, carrying around a phone in your pocket is so commonplace that nobody can imagine anymore a time when we didn't do that. The miracles Jesus refers to are the miracle of a seed growing. An apparently lifeless seed is planted in the ground and turns into a large plant a plant large enough to be harvested as a crop and turned into bread to feed a whole family. Here in northern Ohio, we are surrounded by farms, so this miracle is happening all around us. Yet we don't see it, and those of us who are town and silly, city, excuse me, maybe silly, but certainly city dwellers like myself, uh, don't think about it. But the results are so common that I'm sure even a lot of people that live out among the farms give it very little or no thought. Sometimes, though, when I stumble onto passages like this, I try to imagine how our ancestors might have looked upon this miracle. The very first ones, the ones who engineered the agrarian revolution and went from hunting and gathering nuts and leaves to actually planting crops and harvesting them. I asked myself, what did they think when they first realized they could take a seed from a tomato or a watermelon? What did they think when they threw the seeds of wheat into the soil and then weeks later saw them sprouting as plants? And what did they think even when, even more weeks later, they harvested the wheat or the rich red fruit of a big juicy tomato and bit into it? 
And imagine then those few seeds yielding enough fruit to feed a whole family. I'm sure it took a long time to connect the two actions, the planting and the harvesting, and even more time before somebody started doing it on purpose. But eventually agriculture was born and our species became less dependent on what it could find because they had discovered they could plant and harvest what they wanted and needed. And I think we may be forgiven if we stay fixated on the miracle of the seed growing and ignore the real lesson here, which is not about seeds, but about power. The power in the seeds, the power of the growth. Jesus said that the power in the seeds is akin to the power of the kingdom of God. So what these parables are about is power, the power of God, the power of the kingdom of God. And we're all aware of power. It's all around us. You and I use it every week, every day. We can't seem to escape thoughts and discussions of power. We live in a world in which demonstrations of power are constantly parading before us and lurking around us. We live in a world in which power is constantly changing hands, in which power is the token that we negotiate and vote and fight and struggle over. But the parables point out an especially important distinction between the power that we sometimes exercise and are often subject to and the life-giving power of God. You see, for us, power is coercive. We humans use power to enforce our will. The tools we use to do that, of course, vary. They range from talking and wheedling to emotional blackmail or pulling on heartstrings to voting as a community to shouting and pressure all the way up to the use of weapons from stones to knives to guns and bombs. Whatever tool we use, we always exercise power as coercion. But that's not the power that Jesus speaks of. The power of God is not coercive. He doesn't force his will. His power is always creative, generative, and renewing. The power of God is seen in the creation, in the miracle of each human life, in the seeds and plants all around us, from the smallest amoeba to the farthest black hole of the galaxy. The power of God creates and that is what Jesus is talking about in today's gospel. You see, we talk about, and I'm certain you've heard me talk about a lot, the kingdom of God, because that is the essence of the gospel message, that the kingdom of God has drawn near. They are the first words recorded, spoken by Jesus. Repent and believe in the gospel, he said, because the kingdom of God has come near. But I have to ask, do we really understand what living in his kingdom is like? I'm not sure, so sure we do. We are, after all, Americans. And we think, for most of us, when we picture a monarchy or a kingdom, we imagine a symbolic royal house with a kindly old grandpa or grandma figure with no real political power who presides over public occasions like dedications and the opening of parliaments, and fronts for charities. But that's not really what a kingdom is when Jesus is talking about a kingdom. Digging a little deeper, the Greek term basileia tu theou, which we translate as the kingdom of God, can also be translated the authority of God or the power of God. So for our purposes today, we can say that the kingdom of God means the same thing as the power of God. And unlike earthly power, which is used coercively to force people to do something or to force them not to do something using the fear of punishment, the power of God is the created, creative, loving, forgiving, compassionate energy of God, creating not just a new world, 
but a new me and a new you. And there's something else. Because, because God's power is creative and not coercive, that power has a different effect on us. Earthly power, because it threatens and forces, rules by a kind of fear. We don't speed because we don't want to get caught, usually. We don't steal for the same reason. But God's power isn't reactive in that way. God's power is attractive. It doesn't force. It seduces. The power of God is expressed in his love and his care. And as such, it seduces us into a whole new relationship with God where we are made whole. The same way that seed is made whole. God's remaking of us begins with the planting of a seed, the planting of his word, which grows as we mature in the faith to remake us into something new, a new humanity finally, fully expressing the image of God which we bear. That brings us to something else about the power of God. Jesus says the kingdom of power of God is like a mustard seed. Now, Let's think about a mustard seed, what it is and what it is like. We often think that a mustard seed is something that's cultivated or was cultivated in ancient Palestine, but that's not entirely true. A few bushes of mustard seed were cultivated, but for the most part, the mustard seed was like a weed. That means aside from that very minimal cultivation, the abundant mustard seed grew wherever it wanted, wherever the seeds landed by virtue of being caught up in the wind and carried. The nearest thing in our experience that I can compare it to is a dandelion. Dandelions are hardy and abundant. They free float and they are trespassers. They are a weed that sprouts from a very tiny seed. In fact, one seed of a dandelion, I can hardly see if I hold it in my hand. And if you've ever fought, fought them in your lawn, you know what I'm talking about. Over the years, both as a boy and as a man, I've done more than my share of trying to root out dandelions out of the lawn. I've dug them up. I've cut them. My dad had me put weed and feed on them. At one time, he was having um, a service come and put, uh, uh, I'm sorry, fluid or uh, weed and feed on the lawn in order to encourage the grass and discourage the dandelions. And no matter what we did, whether it was digging up or putting chemicals on the lawn, dandelions always persisted. I see neighbors, mainly of my dad, who were very dedicated to their lawns and they carefully nurtured the grass in their lawn, growing only a certain kind of grass. And every year they would get rid of the dandelions, either by digging them out or by killing them, only to have them take root again the next spring and start the cycle all over again. But have you ever seen dandelions or take root in a sidewalk or a parking lot crack? Almost always, they don't get attacked there, so they grow freely, and they grow big. And wherever, wherever the dandelion roosts and begins to grow, aside from lawns, there are other weeds that also take root and grow big. In fact, they begin, they're so big that they begin, after they turn into weeds, to push up through the concrete. And if left long enough, they not only push aside the dirt so they can sprout and grow big, they push aside the very concrete of the sidewalk. They raise it and crack it and crumble it, and before long, they've destroyed the sidewalk. Mustard seeds did that in ancient Palestine. They floated wherever the wind took them, and they took up root in the cracks between the large stone blocks of walls and buildings and in whatever garden or field they happen to be floating over. And if left untended, they would push the blocks apart and crack them and crumble them. Left on their own, mustard seeds, like any weed, can bring down a whole building 
and temples and cities, and they did it. They do it. So the power of God doesn't just create and grow a new you within the old you. That very growth that God is engineering pushes and cracks and eventually crumbles the old you so the new creation can take root and take its place. And what is true of you and I as persons is true of the world at large. The power of God is at work in the world, taking root as a tiny seed and then growing and pushing and cracking the old world, the old structures, the old institutions, the old systems, the old ways until they no longer stand and, and so are supplanted by the newness of God's creation. Knowing this has been a great comfort to me, and I imagine many of you. At each stage of my life, I reached a point where I was actually pretty satisfied with myself. I was settled and content, and the world seemed as if it was a place where I could fit, a place that seemed to run well and in which I could live peaceably and know that things, the places, the institutions, the ways, the people, everything around me was reliable. It happened when I was 19. It happened when I was 25 and 30 and 35. But at each stage, and I don't know if, this, if it was this way with you, at each stage, it has been for me and for most of the people that I've talked to about it, at each stage, turmoil would eventually strike. Things would come unglued. And I would find myself having to adopt in having to adapt in some way with new habits or new skills, with new people, with new or transformed institution, institutions, with new ways of doing things, new traditions. And each time that happened, I would feel myself, as the comedian would say, discombobulated for a while. And then I would remember that God is at work, that the promises of God are true still, and that my life rests not in myself or in the people around me or in the ways of the world or in the institutions or the way of doing things that I'm used to. My life rests in Jesus. As God says in Isaiah, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. desert. And as soon as I recall that, I can relax and I can step back and I can begin to discern where the newness is and to begin living that newness in the moment. And here's the great conundrum, at least for me it is. Salvation, life, redemption, new life that we talk about. None of it depends on me. The harder I try, the farther away I push myself. The conundrum is that the way to grow as a Christian is to let God do it, to accept what Christ is doing in my life. Oh yes, I must somehow stop clinging to the old me. I can't go back to the womb. I can't go back to being 19 again, or 35, or even 50. But I can see what God is doing, and I can accept it and allow him to guide my growth in the way that he knows best. And having reached that conclusion, I can relax and I can settle in to the new situation I've been given and be content again. I'm told, because I'm not involved in sports to that great an extent, but I'm told that those who are involved in sports a great deal know that performance is not based on just trying harder. Great players focus on the basics and allow those seeds to take root and bear fruit in their lives during the game. For me, the example is camping or photography. I know the basics. I know how to adjust a camera and to focus the lens. I know these things and I keep practicing to get better. But it's not trying harder, it's trying smarter. For an for a, um, a, uh, athlete, 
during the game, they have to relax into the memory that they have built in their body, their muscle memory. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The kingdom, the authority, the power of God has invaded our lives, and God wants us to experience the abundant life that is ours because of Jesus' death and resurrection. God wants us to be strong and fruitful and loving and forgiving and compassionate and active Christians. That is God's gift to us. So God invites us, seduces us, convince us, convinces us and attracts us to stop trying harder on our own and to just rest in his arms and to allow God's work to work in our lives and lead us into the ministries and the transformations to which he calls us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. Each petition ends with Lord in your mercy, and our response is, hear our prayer. Holy God, you plant the seeds of faith in every nation. Enliven your church so that the good news of your grace may root and grow throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our creator, even the trees, the shrubs, and the flowers delight in your goodness. From the depths of the soil to the highest mountain, bring forth new plants. Restore growth to places suffering drought. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Judge of nations, we pray for our leaders and those in power. Grant them the ability to regard those under their charge with humility, dedicating their lives in service to others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Divine Comforter, you show compassion to those in need and provide le relief to those who call on you. Bless all who suffer, especially people trapped in cycles of poverty and homelessness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sovereign God, our houses of worship belong to you. We give thanks and pray for our church, our musicians, we dedicate ourselves to the joyful noise that comes from these places, the cries of children, the melody of voices and instruments, and the songs from our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we give thanks for our ancestors in the faith who are now at home with you, especially this week we remember Stuart. We look forward to that day when we are united in your new creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. And now, our Lord God bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God.